Summary of If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. Tish, who is 19 years old, goes to see Fanny, who is locked up in the tombs in Lower Manhattan. She tells him through a glass wall that she is pregnant with his child. Did you tell Frank, he asks, referring to his father? No, Tish says, I only told you. Even though he's happy, he suddenly gets serious and asks what she's going to do about it. She tells him that everything will work out and that he'll be out of jail by the time she gives birth. He asks, are you sure about that? Tish goes home and tells her mother, Sharon, that she is pregnant and everything goes well. Sharon isn't surprised at all, and she tells Tish not to feel like a bad girl. Later, her father, Joseph, says the same thing, and Tish's sister, Ernestine, tells her to unbow her head. After Tish's family celebrates her pregnancy, Joseph calls Frank and tells him to come over. He tells Frank to bring Fanny's mother, Mrs. Hunt, and his two sisters, Adrian and Sheila. When Fanny's family shows up, the strain is clear. Part of this is because Frank and his wife are always fighting. Mrs. Hunt is a very strict and critical religious woman, while Frank is a heavy drinker who doesn't like her. When Tish finally tells the Hunts she is pregnant, Frank is so happy that he tells Joseph they should go out to a bar to party. Mrs. Hunt, on the other hand, asks Tish in an arrogant way who will be responsible for the baby. When Tish tells her that she and Fanny will care for the baby, Mrs. Hunt says, I always knew that you would ruin my son. I've always known that you have an evil inside of you. The Holy Spirit will make that baby die inside of you. She moves toward Tish as she says this, but Frank stands up and slaps her down. Everyone worries about her weak heart, but he laughs as he stands over her. I think you'll find that it's still pumping, he says. I wouldn't call it a heart, though. He and Joseph then leave, though Joseph is unsure. Tish, Ernestine, and Sharon fight with Fanny's mother and two sisters, who all hate him for getting arrested even though everyone knows he's innocent. At one point, Sharon tells Mrs. Hunt that Tish is pregnant with her grandchild and that it doesn't matter how the baby comes into the world. Mrs. Hunt and her children leave after an angry argument. Baldwin shows that Tish and Fanny have known each other since they were kids by telling their stories throughout the story. At first, they didn't like each other because they had fought before. Tish was pulled away as she tried to pull Fanny's friend Daniel off of her own friend Geneva. She grabbed a board and swung it, hitting Fanny in the face with an old nail that was lodged in the wood and she didn't know about. Tish ran away as Fanny was bleeding, and he went after her. When he caught up to her, he spat in her face. After this happened, Tish didn't see him for a few days, and she feared that by scraping him with a rusty nail, she had given him lockjaw. She couldn't wait any longer, so she went to Frank's sewing shop. There, she found out that Mrs. Hunt had sent Fanny to visit some cousins and that he would be back soon. I'll tell him you want to come by, Frank said with a knowing smile. A few days later, Fanny came back and told Tish he was sorry for spitting in her face, and she told him she was sorry for hitting him. After that, they were always together. Tish also tells the story of the first time she and Fanny had sex and how they spent the night in the village. After going to a Spanish restaurant where Fanny was a regular, they went to his dirty apartment in the village, where Fanny asked her to marry him. But because he is an artist, he told her he wouldn't be able to give her much other than his undying love. When she agreed to spend the rest of her life with him, they laid down on a mattress, and Tish lost her virginity. The next morning, they went to Tish's apartment in Harlem early in the morning and told her parents that they wanted to get married. At first, Joseph was unsure, but he soon agreed. Tish and her mother go to see Mr. Hayward, Fanny's lawyer, the Monday after Tish tells the Hunts she is pregnant. Hayward is a young white guy who Ernestine talked into taking the case because, in her job as a child defender, she often works with lawyers. Hayward tells him that Mrs. Rogers, the Puerto Rican woman who said Fanny raped her, has left the United States and is most likely back in her home country. He says that this makes their case even tougher. Since Fanny was with Tish and Daniel at the time of the claimed rape, it's clear that her claim is weak. Hayward might be able to get Rogers to accept this if he could talk to her. 
but the office of the district attorney seems to know this, so it has sent her away to hide. Worse, Daniel has been jailed. Daniel has a record, as you know, says Hayward. It's clear that they want to get him to change his story. Hayward says that this will make his job very hard, but he will do everything he can to show Fonny's innocence. He needs more money right now because he needs to hire private detectives to find Mrs. Rogers. Unfortunately, it will take time to get this money, and Tish knows that every day that goes by makes Fonny feel worse. Tish says that Fonny and Daniel talked again right before Fonny was arrested. After not seeing each other for a long time, they ran into each other on the street. They went back to Fonny's apartment and talked about Daniel's recent two-year jail sentence while Tish made dinner. Daniel told Fonny that he had been caught for taking a car, even though he doesn't know how to drive. But because he was caught with weed, he felt stuck. The courts knew this, so they gave him a choice, he could either plead guilty and get a lighter sentence, or he could stick to his story and risk getting an even tougher ruling. Daniel pleaded guilty because he felt completely alone and helpless. He spent two hard years in jail, years that changed his life for good. Tish goes to Hayward's and then goes to the tombs to see Fonny and tell him the bad news about Mrs. Rogers. She tries to stay positive, but that night she has a terrible dream about Fonny driving full speed off a hill. When she wakes up, her mother is sitting on her bed and looking at her. I know I can't help you very much right now, Sharon tells her. But I've been through pain, if that helps. I know it's going to end. I'm not going to tell you that everything always works out for the best. She then tells Tish to pay attention to her baby and remember that love brought you here. The next morning, Tish gets up and goes to work as a seller at a perfume station. That day, Ernestine goes out for a drink with Tish and tells her that Sharon should go to Puerto Rico to look for Mrs. Rogers. She says that Hayward can't go because he has to deal with Belle, the racist cop who says he saw Fonny running away from the scene of the crime, even though he caught Fonny on the other side of town, which is so far that it's impossible to think Fonny ran there. Ernestine also tells Tish that it doesn't matter if Mrs. Rogers is telling the truth or not, because Mrs. Rogers believes herself. She has to, because naming her rapist, even if she's wrong, helps her feel like she's dealt with the pain. That's it. For her. She'll go crazy if she changes her story, she says. She then tells Tish that she has a plan to get Officer Bell to change his statement. Since she knows Bell killed a young black boy in Brooklyn a few years ago, she wants the boy's mother and Bell's wife, who hates him, to show up at the trial. She hopes this will confuse Bell and hurt his credibility. Joseph and Frank also come up with a plan to help with this tough situation. They start stealing things from their bosses and selling them in Harlem to pay for Fonny's court fees. Sharon agrees to go to Puerto Rico. When she finally finds Mrs. Rogers, she tries to get her to love her like a mother, since Mrs. Rogers is also a mother. She does this by showing Mrs. Rogers a picture of Fonny and Tish and telling her that Tish is her daughter and will have Fonny's baby. Talking about this, though, only brings back Mrs. Rogers' pain, which makes her start screaming. Soon after that, she goes missing again, but this time for good, and Sharon has to go back to the United States as a loser. Tish tells the story of how they first met Officer Bell, which is an important part of Fonny's case. After they found a loft to rent together, they went for a walk and stopped at a small food shop. Fonny went around the block to buy cigarettes while Tish picked out tomatoes. At that point, a sketchy white guy started to bother Tish by touching her behind and saying rude things. He grabbed her arm when she tried to leave, so she hit him and spat in his face. Officer Bell was on the other side of the street when Fonny walked up and beat the man up. This got Officer Bell's notice. Bell ignores the white man and tries to tell Fonny that he's going to take him to the police station. The grocer steps in and says that Fonny wasn't doing anything wrong, then insults Bell in front of a group of people. In revenge, Bell tells Fonny that he'll be seeing him around. When they get back to Fonny's flat that night, there is a police car across the street. After Sharon comes back from Puerto Rico, 
Joseph sits down with Tish and tells her she needs to focus on her health and quit her job. Understanding that the baby is connected to, Fonny's, desire to be free, Tish takes this advice and starts going to see Fonny every day, which makes his mood much better. Even though this helps, it doesn't make the case any clearer, and the hearing keeps getting pushed back. Worse, when Hayward finally gets Fonny's bail set, until the trial, it is so high that no one could pay it. Frank is very upset by this, and when his boss finds out he's been taking and fires him, he drives out of the city and kills himself. When Tish hears this, she just sits there and can't say anything. When she looks at her mother, everything but Sharon's eyes go dark, and an incredible intelligence fills the air. At this point, Tish sees that she is about to have a baby. She quickly realizes that her time has come. About the author. James Baldwin was born in Harlem in 1924. His grandfather was a slave, and he was the oldest of nine children. Even though his real father wasn't there, the young author's stepfather was soon a Baptist preacher called David Baldwin. Baldwin's relationship with David would change over the years, but it would also shape him. Baldwin's experience as a youth minister in an opposite church was both a response to and a rejection of his Baptist preacher's stepfather's example. Baldwin said that his time in the church, where he had to prepare and give several sermons a week, was an important part of his growth as a writer because it pushed him to think about a wide range of human feelings. In his most famous book, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and in his play, The Amen Corner, he talks about these things. After he graduated from high school, Baldwin spent most of his time as a book reviewer in Greenwich Village, which was a hub of imagination and forward thinking at the time. Around this time, the famous author Richard Wright saw Baldwin's ability and helped him get a grant so he could work on a book and make money while he did it. Baldwin went to Paris in 1948 to get away from America both physically and mentally so he could write more clearly about his home country. The result was the book Go Tell It on the Mountain, which he put out in 1953. Baldwin moved back to the United States in 1957. When he did, he joined the civil rights movement. This was the start of his well-known career as an outspoken agitator and socially aware public thinker who fought for calm answers to race tensions in America. Baldwin spent the last 10 years of his life working in France. In the wake of the deaths of civil rights worker Medgar Evers and civil rights leader Martin Luther King, Jr., he wrote a number of important works about American identity. In 1987, he died in St. Paul, Delaware, Vence, France, of stomach cancer. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.